Welcome to this short lecture on the jugular venous pressure or JVP. So this lecture will firstly cover the anatomy of the jugular veins, then we'll go into some physiology of how the actual waveform and so forth works, and then we'll look briefly at some pathologies associated with the pressure. So firstly let's get our bearings. So this image here what you can see, it's looking at a side view of the right side of the face. You can see in blue are the veins. So this one here is the external jugular vein which comes from the retromandibular vein coming down and joining the subclavian vein. Running deeper, which you can't see in your patient, is going to be the internal jugular vein. So this is draining the brain. It's going to come through the jugular foramen and it's going to come and it's going to be impeded mostly by this red muscle which is the sternocleidomastoid. So in a patient you would have them 30, 45 degrees and you'll get them to tilt their head away and then you'd see the SCM come out. So the internal jugular vein is really impeded by this sternocleidomastoid. It will come together which will come and join with the other opposing jugular vein or the brachiocephalic vein which will go into the right atria. So what we can see here, this is the other view which is a frontal cut through the heart. So we can see the ventricles in the atria, aorta, pulmonary arteries and here are these jugular veins. So this is going to be the internal jugular vein coming down with the subclavian meeting the other internal or the brachiocephalic coming down into the superior vena cava and then that will enter into the right atria meeting up with the inferior vena cava. So there's your heart in that plane. So essentially the blood, we, what we're going to be looking at with the jugular venous pressure is the blood that's inside this vein. Now because it is impeded by the sternocleidomastoid you can't actually see it but what you can possibly do is you can see pulsations in it, okay? And depending on how high up the pulsations are would depend if that JV pressure is increased or not. Now normally it should be less than three centimeters. So where's that three centimeters measured from? Well it's coming off the sternal angle. So the sternal angle is essentially where the manubrium and the body of the sternum meet and it has a slight uh, angle to it and that's called the angle of Louis. And so it's this angle here, okay, so this sternal angle which is actually five centimetres above the right atrium. So the sternal angle is going to be kind of up here. Now, if you can see where the pulsations are in your patients, so again you've got them on an angle, you've got their tilt, head tilted away. Now just the reason why we use the right internal jugular vein and not the left is because the left comes from the other side and it's not a good rep representation of this column of blood. It's better to go up with the right side. So if you look at the right atria, when it's um, empty in its blood down into the right ventricle, so the right ventricle is in diastole, it gives an indication of blood, this big column of blood that is continuous all the way up, SVC, all the way up to the internal jugular. So this gives you an indication, the jugular venous pressure, of not only the pressure in the internal jugular, but also the, the superior vena cava, which is going to give you essentially the central venous pressure, but it'll also give you the pressure within the right atria and when it's filling or, once the, or when the tricuspid valves open, it will give you the pressure in the end diastolic of the right ventricle. So it gives you all this ability to pick the pressure up here. Now, going off from the sternal angle, which we said is five centimetres above the right atria, when you look at the internal jugular on the right side, having their head tilt, tilted away. If you see pulsations, what you will then do is get a ruler and come off from that point of measurement. So let's say that's where your ruler, well, that's where you find the pulsation at the highest point. That's where your ruler comes off and then you measure down to the sternal angle and that will give you the height. Now if it is greater, if it's greater than three to four centimeters, 
then it will be considered to be an elevated JVP. So essentially the higher it is, the worse it is because that's telling you there's a greater pressure in the system. Now some reasons for why you'd have extra pressure. You could have an overload of fluid. There could be problems with the, the valves. There could be a problem with the right ventricle. There could be a problem with the pressure in the pulmonary system. Or there could be a problem with the way that the heart is allowed to expand, such as with the pericardium. There's probably other, many more ones, but these are some examples of the most common. Now, let's be, before we go into those cases, let's just have a quick look at how the physiology is occurring. So down on this trace, what we have is the ECG. So you can see the P wave, the QRS, okay, back into the T wave. Okay, now with the heart sounds, we can see we've got two main heart sounds, and this is going to be your S1 and S2. Now, coming up to the JV pulse, so if you were, now you won't necessarily be able to see this with your naked eye. Some people who are very good in this area, they might be able to see pulsation changes, okay? But generally speaking, this would have to come from a device that would sit in the um, superior vena cava, so a central venous trace. Now what we'll see is the first trace, the first bump, so this is actually essentially a waveform in the jugular, um, internal jugular vein or the SVC. So what the first thing, the first wave you'll see is what we call the A wave and that is corresponding to atrial contraction or at least to that point. So all of this up to that point is atrial contraction. And you can see it corresponds pretty well to the P wave. So the P wave is the electrical firing in the, so the SA node fires, depolarizes through the atria, and that, that really matches up quite well to the atria contraction. So then what we see is that we see a drop, okay? We see a drop in the, the pressure. Now, just as a side point, the, usually the, the times you would see normally an increase in wave pressure in the JVP pulse is the atria is filled or the, um, the valves are closed. So that's usually the two wa the waves that have gone up is when either the valves are closed or the, the atria are filled or contracting. So you can see the first A wave is actually atrial contraction and that's the atria squeezing. So that's going to build the pressure up and you can see why you get the, the dip up. Then it starts to, well, this, this, this wave kind of going down to here to the bottom trough, that's really atrial um, relaxation now, or atrial distal, diastol, should I say. So that's dropping off here. But what you'll see is this little spike up here. And the reason why you get that spike is because you get the valves closing. So these two valves will close. And this is the C wave, which is, going to be C with the S1, almost corresponding with the S1 wave, so that's the closure of the tricuspid, or actually both valves close. But in terms of this, we're just focusing on the tricuspid. So this here would be the tricuspid closing, okay? That's the C wave. Now that's closed, but the atria will still continue to fill or still continue to relax. So it's relaxing, okay? So at this point, you could probably guess from S1, we are now going into ventricle systole. And that marries up pretty well to the QRS. Okay, so you see the QRS, and now the, the ventricles are contracting. So as that's starting to contract, we want these to be closed off. That's the C, that's the C wave there, which is sending pressure up in here because it's closed now. We've got a closed system, so the pressure in here is higher. That's why we get this. Now, the, the right atria is going to start to expand, and this is now going down to this part here. Okay, and this gives you the lower dip, and this is the X wave, which is the essentially the the, the relaxation, the complete relaxation of the atria. Now, as we start to go back up. This is going up to the top, which is a V wave. That V wave is essentially going to be the atria is now filling, filling. So it's expanded, but now it's filling. So blood is being sucked into it. And so as it fills with blood, the pressure goes up. And that's why we said the second wave up. 
And so that's the next peak. And then what we see happen kind of here is the tricuspid opens. Tricuspid opens. So this valve now opens and we drop the pressure back down. Okay, and then we're ready to go into a next phase. So now the, the right atrium is open, so the, the blood starts to fill down into the right ventricle. So now we've kind of gone into ventricular diastole. That was ventricular systole. So now we're in ventricle um, diastole as that is dropping its fluid off. So we've already peaked up here. It's, it, this, this phase up here is the atria fill-in. But as we've opened the valve, the pressure drops away. So this will start to drop into there. And that's why we get this drop away. And then the atria contract and we go back into an A wave and the cycle starts again. So hopefully you can see how the ECG corresponds to the venous pulse as well as the S sounds. So now to look in its kind of pathology state. So what would cause an increased fluid in that um, the, the jugular or the venous system. Well, you could have just extra fluid in the whole system. So sometimes if you've got left-sided heart failure and there's not enough fluid going out, the body reacts to this by doing the renin-angiotensin system, so increases volume and drives the sympathetic nervous system. And that will increase more fluid going back in the ventral system or in, back into the venous system. So more fluid is going back Therefore, you might get an increased JVP with an increased volume. Likewise, on the opposite, you'll get a decreased JVP if you are dehydrated or got hypovolemia. Now, what else would cause issues with the, um, an increased pressure, or increased volume in the, um, or pressure in the JVP is problems with the right ventricle. So if, if it's failing, if it's not contracting hard enough, fluid will go back and build up into this. So that would be typically right-sided heart failure. Or if you've got certain um, lung conditions like COPD, we get um, a decrease in like the Q, the VQ, the VQ mismatch, and so pressure will build back into the pulmonary system. So this is pulmonary hypertension, and that's gonna build back into the right ventricle, which will go back in the right atria, go back into the uh, SVC go back into the internal jugular. Another reason for um, increase in JVP. Another one would be that the heart just can't it can't feel well. So the outer covering around the heart, being the pericardium, might be filled with fluid, such as a tamponade, like f blood or something, or fluid, or it might be constricted or restricted, like it might be fibrotic. So this might be like a pericarditis, a res restricted pericarditis, which would stop it allowing to fill. Now, how can some of these change these waves? Well, if you've got pulmonary hypertension, so you've got COPD, that means the, um, the lungs aren't ventilated well, therefore your perfusion to them is um, shunted away, therefore the pressure in here is increased. That means the pressure goes back down to here, which increases the pressure in the right ventricle. So that would tell you that it's harder to get the fluid down from the right atria down. So as your atria is trying to contract, it's harder, it has to work harder to push the blood into it. And so we might see with a pulmonary hypertension an increased A wave, a bigger A wave, okay? Likewise, you might also see, um, sorry, I didn't, didn't put a Y wave there. I missed the Y wave, sorry. So the other downward dip is the Y wave, okay, opposed to the X wave. And what we've had here is this is the emptying of the atria. So this is emptying down. So if you have a change in the Y wave, which would be also affected, that might be um, dampened off in um, pulmonary hypertension. Another example of what might happen, if you've got atrial fibrillation, so this is not contracting, it's just fibrillating, you're not going to have a very big A wave at all. So you might see a, a flattened A wave there. Uh, another example would be um, a valve that is regurgitating or this tricuspid valve is incontinent. So that means when you go into a systole, so as this is going 
So you've got your closure of this, which gives you the C wave, and the ventricles are contracting as your atria, going down to the X wave, is relaxing. So as this is contracting, what would happen if this is um, regurgitating or incontinent, the fluid will go back into it. And as a result, you might see a no X wave and it kind of goes straight across to the V wave or a CV wave, maybe even a higher one. And then finally, we might see in the pericardial problems where it's a problem with opening, we might see changes in the Y wave, okay, because this is the atrial emptying, okay, so this is, it's gone up, the tricuspid valve has opened, okay, and the atria is now emptying. So if you've got a problem with the heart being able to open, okay, you're going to have a problem with this wave. And it might be a sharp wave or it might be a shallow wave. And that's an example of problems there. So that's the end of today's one on JVP. Hopefully now you have an understanding of where the internal jugular is, how you would measure it, what you're looking for, what the amount is for at least the, the height compared to the sternal angle, what's kind of happening in the heart functionally, and then more the physiology and particularly with pathology.